uh, companies to compete against that. So they didn't end up using more than one or two, best of my recollection. It's been a while. And then after that, I went into uh, telemetry and range systems at Vandenberg and uh, worked that. So uh, telemetry upgrades, so forth and so on uh, for tracking uh, missiles and rockets um, as they uh, launch. And then since then, I've been in the uh, private sector uh, consulting and then also very involved with the AIAA and also the National Defense Industrial Association, NDIA. So two great organizations. If you want to meet people you never would have met before, and uh, programs and networking, lo lots of great stuff. So um, anyway, so that's kind of my background. Does anybody have any questions? I guess if you do, you, you like you raise your hand on this somehow and Ken can uh, unmute you. But um, aside from that, okay. So you know, I see a number, I see a couple of folks on here, a lot of people on the phone. Uh, and, um, you know, just talk, uh, either if they have their video uh, or, um, you know, they're just calling in with a phone or don't want to use their video. Um, it can contain all the aliens, so, um, but you never know, they're always out there and space is a uh, harsh environment. So <laughs> we got to experience that. It's a, uh, okay. Um, so, okay, anyone else wanna kind of tell us anything about their career or um, professional work and uh, interface uh, organization? Yes. The, the uh, video that you're showing, is that current? I mean, is that actually being live streamed from a satellite right now? Well, I believe Ken has uh, pulled this up. Uh, Ken, see, I'm in Las Vegas, Ken's in LA, so it's a truly uh, you know, joint operation here. Ken is managing all that, and I believe this, it says live. So this is live now. Yeah, it's live. But what's confusing me is where it shows, where I believe it shows the space station is, kind of like in the center graphic on the bottom, it shows okay. the yellow there, and that is definitely not in the uh, darkness. So I don't know why the top photo is, you know, showing a night view. Um, and the well, the bottom right one looks I, like I that one. What's that? Yeah, I think the map graphic uh, is current based on the position of the Terminator, the day-night area. Look, that looks current. The top, I think, is probably rather delayed. In fact, a few minutes ago, it, it seemed as though it was crossing the Nile Delta, and, and you could see the coastline of Israel lit up in the upper right of the screen, and it was going south, so the, the station was on the descending node, and um, that view, I suspect, is probably a number of hours old based on just orbital mechanics, but the one in the, um, the map, that seems to be correct because it shows um, California to be right on the Terminator and the sun just went down here. Right, yeah. So... But from what I understood, I'm going to bring this up on my phone because I have the app on my phone. I'm going to see if it's showing a different picture. So I'll be able to let you know in a minute. Of course, the reminder is the, the reminder always comes up <laughs> wanting to use it. So now I got to go searching for it in my apps. Um, Let's see. Let's see it. Um, yeah. It's a little loud again. 
Okay, so here, this that looks like a nice daytime view coming up on possible darkness here. Um, it's a little fuzzy. Yeah, so it's showing it's showing a live view here, sunset in uh, 30, 30 minutes. Based on the direction of the um, motion, um, I would say that um, south is at the top of the screen. And so you might be, you should see the Kamchatka Peninsula come up at the bottom if it's oh. current. Yeah, and on my phone here, it's just showing the orbital track and it's showing the uh, that same Earth view. Oh. Did you, yeah, I think the two match now. Looks like the two of them match. Yeah. Did you switch the views at all, Ken, or just did it did whatever it does? And it is whatever it does. Okay. <laughs> all right. And it's it's and there's no control over it, it's. They're kind of blurry. You know, the bottom ones. I don't know, but. Um, I just, oh, okay. Is, is is there any? Are there any? Um, settings for uh, resolution or anything or Hey, while we're waiting, um, I hope I, you know, nobody minds if I take a few minutes to um, say a few things right. uh, to explain why my name appears the way it does. At um, on my on my screen, it's I'm on the um, I don't do a fuck. upper upper right, and um, so um, in addition to being on the AIAA Las Vegas Los Angeles Las Vegas Section Council, I'm also president of the uh, Los Angeles chapter of the National Space Society, known locally as OASIS. And uh, we cooperate with AIAA and other organizations and uh, work together. And um, NSS, National Space Society, is a public interest group that promotes the exploration, commercialization, and eventual settlement of space. Um, they, the, um, the local chapter has a number of events, although right now we're understandably on a holding pattern. Um, we intend to start putting out a newsletter. So anybody um i tr contact me if you want to write something um and uh, of course the iaa newsletter is also always looking for articles i'm sure the contact information is on the section website uh the other thing is nss does have an annual convention every year known as isdc the international space development conference it's held in a different city every year uh this year it would have been held in late may in dallas but it was canceled. Um, they're thinking of having some other kind of event later on in the year. Uh, they haven't been too specific about it. But as far as I know, it is on, they are on track for next year's ISDC, which will be late May in LA. So it's good for a lot of us that we don't have to travel. And those of you in Las Vegas, you don't have to travel very far. So I'm going to keep the section posted as that develops. And I could tell about people about myself. I don't know if that's particularly interesting, though. <laughs> very, very interesting. You've got a PhD in this stuff, so. Well, yeah. Well, I've kind of uh, done a number of different things with my career. And actually, it's funny you should mention the PhD because uh, the PhD makes me look young on my resume when, when I put dates on because I actually worked for a few years. Um, then I went back to school. Then I went back to work. And um, my uh, first two employers, well, they're now known as Northrop Grumman and Northrop Grumman. They used to be Westinghouse and Norton Systems. And um, after I got my PhD, I spent 15 years at Boeing, various locations in Southern California. And um, 
and did a stint, uh, a couple of stints as a contractor at LA Air Force Base. And um, I think, and um, now I'm an independent consultant, uh, m working with a number of possible clients, particularly XISP Inc., which is a small spin up company a friend of mine founded in the DC area. And uh, we, XISP Inc., have done a number of presentations at IA IAC and at, um, at ISDT. Good. Yeah, I heard all that. Um, Ken, it, it's a little loud again. It didn't quite overcome Seth's voice, but it, it's it's maybe a little louder than, or I don't even know if we really need it at this point. If it it might just keep on varying. So, uh, so you know, maybe just anything you want to tell us about what your PhDs in and what your interests are and and how you got into all this and how you found AAA and yeah. What um, the PhD, I got my uh, bachelor's and master's in physics from Columbia and um, with a minor in math and uh, I somehow managed to get a year of electrical engineering and I started as a radar designer, first at Westinghouse and outside of Baltimore and then at United Technologies Norton Systems and um, I got an acceptance into the NYU Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences where I wanted to be a mathematical physicist. And um, they, they didn't give, this is where you, the lemon turned into lemonade and in that they didn't give me enough financial aid to go full time. Uh, so I started going at night, realized that was going to take forever. Then I was recruited by the Department of Applied Science, which was a remnant of their former engineering school. That's a whole long story in itself. Most of it became Polytechnic Institute of New York, and now now is the Tandon School of Engineering at NYU. But I was sort of the the remnant of the engineering school after they temporarily broke away and then remerged. Um, and um, they uh, recruited me because I, they knew it was going to take me forever to do my doctorate in the math department, and. Um, they were interested in the fact that I was a radar designer because they had a contract from uh, DOD to study um, beaming power, microwave power, up to a constellation of satellites for missile defense. That um, whereas conventional solar arrays would be too big, you know, too much drag at the low altitude. And their actual reason for wanting to beam power up to satellites is to uh, a smaller scale version of the reverse problem that namely putting orbital solar collectors in space and beaming the power to the earth. Yes, that's a very large scale project. This was a way of starting small. But um, eventually I did do some system studies of, of full scale solar power satellites um, and uh, did my dissertation on the power beaming aspect. And um, then I went, to, then I, uh, at a conference, I had a, kind of an accidental encounter with a Boeing manager who um, recruited me. And he said, well, I can't, I, it was actually a conference on solar power satellites in Montreal in 1997. And he said, I, uh, you know, I, I can't promise if you come to work for us that you're going to work on solar power satellites. I said, I'm just looking for interesting work at good pay. And he said, well, well, we got plenty of that. And after hearing the term hiring freeze for several years, that was kind of a welcome thing. So we actually, I went to work for Boeing and we actually did do work on solar power satellites under contract to NASA. And then I did some uh, space mission studies, Mars sample return missions. I worked on the uh, Orbital Express um, satellite servicing and refueling, uh, which actually flew and demonstrated satellite servicing and refueling. And um, was um, part of the, alas, unsuccessful Boeing proposal for the GPS-3A um, satellite block. But um, they, um, while I was there, um, two people brought me into the AIAA. I think, um, I think I was recruited into the organization by um, the, the late Ed McCullough, who many of you knew. And um, then Dean Davis, who was our former section chair, got me into the um, Space Colonization Technical Committee. Or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe Dean got me into AIAA and Ed got me into the Space Colonization Technical Committee. But we were all on that committee. And um, that was a great chance to kind of bring the two organizations together because 
that, that as those of you who are on AIAA technical committees know that they generally like to meet two, sometimes three times a year. And usually uh, one of them is at AIAA space and um, which has been retooled into Ascend. And um, the, the Space Colonization Technical Committee, realizing that a, a lot of the committee members were also NSS members, decided to have their second annual committee meeting at the National Space Society Conference at ISDC. And they did that for a few years. Um, I'm not sure what's happening in that committee, but um, that was uh, how I got into the section. It was basically Ed McCullough and Dean Davis. And Dean is still active in the section. Uh, regrettably, we lost Ed um, last year, and um, he was a very visionary fellow, and who knows what he would have come up with if he were able to be with us a few more years. He was still very active. And then uh, your work with Oasis, and how, how does all that tie in with this now? Well, actually, and all that was running in parallel, because um, when I was a student at um, NYU, uh, a classmate of mine, when I was in graduate school, brought me into the New York City chapter of the National Space Society, which then hosted one of the ISDC conferences. And when I got the offer to move to LA and join Boeing, one of the first things I did was contact the OASIS leadership. So I actually moved to LA in November of 1997. And one of the first things I did socially or professionally was I went to the Christmas party of the National Space Society um, the, of the OASIS chapter, which in those days was hosted um, by Bob Gownley, who was and still is at JPL. And um, so eventually the uh, Cheetos rule caught up with me. That is, they had a habit of, um, as the story goes, when they're looking to recruit officers, uh, some innocent young sap is asked to go out and buy some snacks for the meeting. And while he's out of the room, they elect him to office. And I found, I was late to a meeting um, and found out that they had um, elected me vice president. Um, and um, then uh, another time, the meeting was in Pasadena and there was a lot of traffic and I came late. By the time I got there, they were circulating a petition to get me on the NSS board. So I decided I'm going to, I'm going to come on time and they can't do this to me anymore. So I started coming to meetings on time, but somehow they elected me president. Oh, it's a great story. Yeah. So, um, the, uh, actually I, I spared you a lot of details, but there was a lot of, um, serendipity in a lot of the stuff that happened in my career. Um, the, um, the, um, budget for the, the Montreal conference I told you about, was not sufficient for me to attend the entire three days. Just the, you know, one overnight and then the day I speak and then fly back to New York. But I figured if I can get an early enough flight um, the day before, maybe they'll let me crash the sessions the day before and only pay for one day of registration. So the bus ride took from the airport to the hotel took longer than expected because I didn't realize they just take you to some street corner um, and then you have to wait for individual buses to each hotel. By the time I got there, it was 2.30 in the afternoon and that's when the Boeing manager decided to take a break. And then the NASA manager who ran the space solar power program also took a break, saw us talking, figured out what was going on. And the Boeing guy said, you know this guy? And the NASA guy said, yeah, he's a good catch, figuring out what was going on. And I got uh, an offer to fly me out to California for an interview about two days after I got back from Montreal. Things happened pretty fast oh. after that. So it's the, the AIAA involvement in my career at Boeing and other companies and my education and the NSS stuff all kind of interweave. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a moral of the story is participate in these things. Go to stuff in person. You can't do that these days, but go to stuff virtually. Uh, show your face or your avatar or whatever and um, get to know people because you never know when that's going to pay off. So just a hypothetical question. If if you hadn't um, found AAA, what do you think you'd be? Where do you think um, you'd be now and what would you be working? Uh, well, I'd probably still be with NSS. Uh, so that part would still be the case. 
um, as to what would fill the vacuum, I guess, I don't know, maybe I'd like do more stuff with NSS, but in practice, each, each kind of plays off the other in such a way that I don't see how I could have avoided um, getting involved with the AIAA. Um, I find that um, a lot of times organizations are very much dependent on what goes on in their particular area. And so um, with AIAA, it's going to be a professional society wherever you go. Although, for instance, um, Houston, you know, it emphasizes manned space flight. Um, in here in LA, we got launch vehicles and satellites and JPL. Uh, in Las Vegas, Marty, I think you guys have a lot of um, have aeronautics. And um, I know they're starting to get into like uh, small satellite work and, as well. And with NSS, since it appeals not just to the professional, but to the layman, the educator, the grassroots space enthusiast, the student, it's kind of a mixed bag. So every area has its own flavor. But because LA has such a big aerospace presence, in practice, a lot of people in the AIA chapter of the National Space Society are also AIAA members. So it's, it's, if in LA, that's the thing about LA, once you join one, the others will find you. Uh, you can't hide. And so I'm finding that, um, that um, one of the problems, but opportunities of LA is there is so much going on. It's a full-time job almost trying to keep up with it. And um, that's why with the AIAA section, um, we used to have a series of um, offices called ambassadors. And the idea was to have an ambassador to each of the uh, major institutions. We had actually two ambassadors to Boeing and ambassadors to some of the other companies and some of the universities. Um, I actually wound up with three roles. I'm actually, most of the ambassadorships have fallen by the wayside, but I'm actually wearing three hats. Um, I'm the AIAA section ambassador to the National Space Society, at least on the local level, uh, also to the Aerospace Legacy Foundation, which is an organization nominally based in Downey that, um, uh, although they're kind of looking for a permanent home, but they, um, they emphasize the aerospace history of Southern California, and um, a lot of people involved are retired former Boeing, Rockwell, North American, and... Um, and uh, then the third organization I'm working with is AMAN Incorporated, which is a STEM, orga STEM uh, education organization that specializes in outreach to minority and disadvantaged youth. And many people online here know Hal and Betty Walker, the founders. Um, and Hal and Betty, uh, well, Betty, I believe, is a, a retired educator. And Hal, um, um, he, um, he actually was one of the designers of the Apollo laser ranging experiments. He, and he designed and operated the laser. And um, ha they have an affiliate organization in South Africa that they spend several months a year. In fact, they're, that, they're there now. They've been there for several months. And uh, they're at least tentatively scheduled to come back here in May. And um, while they were in South Africa, they started an NSS chapter in Cape Town. So basically each organization, very often one organization spurs the formation of others. Yeah. So uh, along with that, I'm maybe trying to paint the picture of like if, and there are many people that don't even join NSS, AIAA or whatever. Um, is it kind of safe to say your career would have been totally different had you not even found NSS or been interested in it? Yeah, that's right. Because I think... <coughs> what would have happened would have, I think my career would have been more um, routine. I think NSS and AIAA made me aware of some of these visionary concepts um, like solar power satellites, space settlement bases on the moon and so on. And so I would say at least, I would say about two thirds of the time when I was at Boeing, I was actually working on, um, things that one might call visionary. And I think, I think um, if it weren't for these organizations and the awareness of some of these cutting edge ideas, I think my career, I would have still had a career in the aerospace industry, but uh, probably something a little more uh, routine, maybe oriented more toward a, a product line like, uh, you know, the Delta launch vehicles or the 702 satellites and less oriented toward some of the, um, contract and independent R&D, which is mostly what I've done. 
Wow. That's real powerful. It's, um, I got, I feel the same about my career with, um, that you brought up the concept that it makes you more visionary and see a bigger picture and kind of steer things more. Um, it almost like a, a lets you know more of what you're interested in, but you didn't realize you're interested in it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. It's like, this is what I would have been doing and immersing myself all along had I know about it. But fortunately, I do know about it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and the um, a lot of the things that NSS have advocated for years, like the commercialization in space, that um, com commercial public space flight, we're now starting to see happen with companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. And um, I know that it's been said at one of the NSS meetings that um, of the situation we're now in in the industry um, is was sort of um, something that Robert Heinlein predicted where there would be a false dawn of the expansion into space followed by a long quiescent period and then things would kind of start to break out. And that is kind of what we saw. We, we had a burst of intensive exploration with Apollo and we had some, you know, meanwhile, we had some planetary missions that uh, slowly but surely pushed the envelope. But um, a lot of the visionary stuff that a lot of us grew up with, you know, either, you know, growing up in the age of Apollo or, or um, you know, reading science fiction, a lot of that, a lot of what we thought we'd see early in our career is finally starting to happen, although later in our career than we might have wanted but at least we're around to see it and I would say in the case of some of us uh, you and me Marty in particular even participated yeah. and it's kind of fascinating um, how when we were pretty young at least myself high school age is when we first went to the moon and then to see us likely going back um, in this lifetime uh, two times you think of all the people that have lived on the earth that never experienced that and to have that happen uh, a second time now, which I, I believe will be the springboard off into many, many more times in the future. Yes. So, you're truly born in the space age. It's, it's like the, the best time to ever have been uh, show up here on this uh, big space station. So really grateful for it. So, yeah, that's terrific. Really appreciate you telling your story there, Seth. Um, any, anything else you want to say about it or pretty much a, pretty much covered a lifetime? Um, <laughs> Just a, I think that pretty much covers it, um, to, except to say I'm now an independent consultant. And while, I'm, uh, while I do have a few irons in the fire right now, I'm in a bit of a lull for have, reasons having nothing to do with the coronavirus. So if anybody needs a consultant, let me know. Okay, and what would that uh, specific line of work be? Well, my, my two or three specialties are system design, orbital mechanics, and um, antenna beamforming. Okay, all different frequencies of antennas? Do you specialize in any particular frequency? Um, well, mostly since I've done um, like sort of the, the mathematical modeling end of beam shaping with phased arrays, it would tend to be in the microwave and millimeter wave regime. Oh. Okay, great. We'll keep that in mind. I see uh, my associate Edmund is on, uh, listening in, I, I think. So, um, yeah, great. Okay. Um, so, uh, do you know, uh, this, Maybe a couple of these names sound familiar to me, but you you seem like you knew more of them here, Seth, I guess, right? You made reference to uh, some of the other people on here that knew some of the same people that you did. Oh, you're, you're muted, Seth. Uh, yeah, I see a few familiar names, but offhand, it's hard right now off the top of my head to sort out who I know from where. It's just I, I see familiar names and I know that the stories are similar. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So is there anyone else that would like to tell a little bit of a career story? It's great, you know, hearing Seth's here and, and uh, what his specialty is. And um, 
that's what, what this is all about. It's uh, the whole AAA connection thing, uh, meeting people you normally wouldn't meet. So uh, anyone else want to tell their story? Or I always hate it when people say that on these things. Let's see, how can I more creatively say that? Uh, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe give a, a minute or so here if there's somebody that wants to say something. I could pick on some of my friends. I know a couple people on here. <laughs> um, what do you, hey, my, my name is Barry and I'm down in uh, a different uh, section, uh, down in the Tucson section. And so I just wanted to join in because of the, um, you know, my section down here, they didn't advertise. Um, but I know I don't, ha I have one of those, uh, uh, situations in my career that I probably don't want to advertise, at least certainly not, not much. And so I don't know that there's anything I could, uh, would really want to say too much about it just because it's, um, it's one of those, uh, situations you encounter career ending sort of a thing that I'm trying to overcome and get back into the business after a long hiatus. But, um, um, if anybody knows of any, anyone that needs, a, a someone that's rather expert at navigation, knows a lot about systems engineering, that'd be great. Um, and so I guess in that regard, if anybody had any questions or suggestions, I'd certainly like to hear about them. And now, Ken, the music starts kind of loud again. I don't know who's playing that music. I hear it too. Well, it's, it's part of the video. So we've been trying to mix it so it's just soft in the background. But the thing is, it has its own inflections in it. So it's like generally good for a while and then it, it gets like too loud. We probably don't even need it at this point, Ken. Um, what do you think? Is it too loud now? Yeah, I don't know if we so much. Yeah, probably don't need it anymore. Just, I turned it um, softer now. You can turn it off. Yeah. It's too loud? Yeah, maybe if you turn it off. Um, okay. Yeah, we don't really need it at this point. It was maybe good so, at the beginning when we're being entertained by Klingons, but. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's still too loud now? I, I don't know how much of that. Uh, what? Is, is it still too loud? No, I can't hear. But I think if you if you cut it off, that that'll be good. Well, I don't think we need the music anymore. Okay, can you turn the music off? Maybe just pull the volume all the way down to zero. That's good. So anyway, getting back to uh, barriers. So what how, what kind of navigation work? You mentioned navigation. Um, well, with navigation, I've done um, and or been exposed to uh, pretty much every type of navigation that there is, maybe except for except for maybe interplanetary. But otherwise, I know about you know, strap down or aided navigation in different and various forms, uh, transfer alignment, that kind of navigation, um, positioning just with GPS, differential GPS in the code or the carrier base. So I know a lot about navigation and, and that's actually where I got my experience um, in systems engineering. So, one of the things I'm doing now is I, as I'm in the job market um, is I've been trying to utilize my systems engineering experience to, you know, for kind of a new start, if you will, mm -hmm. and not having so far, not having too much uh, luck with that, yeah. you know, primarily because one of the things I've noticed, and I'll just say this, that this is one of the characteristics about the aerospace career these days just that the way our economy has gone 
it just seems that um, not only our economy, but also, you know, the world situation, um, it seems that there's a lot of um, aerospace engineering type of types of jobs out there that require a security clearance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of knew that early in my career. And, um, and one of the things I've noticed is that once you're, if you have a clearance early in your career, then once that clearance expires, or if it does, then that can make it very difficult or much more difficult to, um, uh, you know, to find your next gig because there's um, on the classified side, employers, you know, when you're more experienced, they don't like to pay for it. They don't want to wait for you to, to come into the company and get a clearance or smaller companies. They just don't want to pay for it. So then the number of jobs in the, that don't require a clearance, at least, at least the ones that you see online, it appears that there's a lot less. Um, and that just seems to be a, I would call it a metric, but a, a cornerstone of the aerospace engineering workplace, which is when you're looking for work, it's a little bit unfortunate. Um, and um, so, so that's a little bit of a story is I've done a lot of navigation work and um, know some systems engineering, trying to get back into the work world and, you know, I know, I know, um, I've, I've been around for, you know, my career so far was maybe going on 20 years, um, headed that way. And uh, I've just taken a hiatus that's too long. But, and, uh, and part of that is because of geography, the Tucson is kind of a one horse town, um, but need to need to get something going soon as I can. So I'm also, I also probably have to be willing to, to relocate. And um, I prefer not to, but it just might be a reality, so. Did you move to Tucson specifically for work originally? Yeah, originally I got a lot of my navigation experience at Honeywell. Mm -hmm. um, and all we did, it was, this was the Honeywell up in Minnesota where they designed all the inertials and the GPS aided inertials for the entire, uh, well, not the entire, but pretty much the whole um, commercial aerospace uh, fleet. And so, you know, my navigation experience was solid, but that's, but my background was in, was in aerospace and, um, and more specifically in control theory at the graduate level. And so I wanted to do that. So I, I branched out and I interviewed all over the country and it just so happened I, I selected a place down in Texas that was TI mm -hmm. and they were developing um, navigation systems for missiles, but they were also doing it for, or they, are, they were also doing the other parts of um, you know, the aerospace career for the same products doing you know cutting edge work and i mean when i mean cutting edge i mean really cutting edge type stuff um you know they were they were doing um high order computer languages before high order computer languages were in the market they just designed their own for their own microprocessors it was incredible what they were doing yeah. so that's where i wanted to go and that was at the same time when the whole missiles business was being reorganized and um, pretty much every missile in the uh, U.S. inventory, not, not all of them, you know, some of the missiles uh, stayed out there in Florida, Orlando, Florida, and, but pretty much everything else except for one, I think, went, uh, came out here to Arizona and Tucson. Um, and so that's where most of them are uh, remain uh, today. And so I came out here to Tucson via a relocation package. Um, and, and I knew at that point in time that it was the, you know, the one horse town, but it was the type of work that I wanted to do. And, 
and uh, over a long period, a longer period of time, I got hit with uh, or affected with a layoff. So then I'm probably not going to be able to go back unless I go someplace else and acquire new skills first, um, or just go someplace else and and um, get into a um, you know a career I like better. Either way, yeah. Um, and uh, just kind of like I don't know if everybody or if anybody here was on the telecon the other night, which I think it was an e-town hall meeting and um, some people on there. And one of the, one of the points from, we'll call it a point from one of the, or two of the gray beards, um, which I'm not old enough to qualify yet for probably, I hope not anyway. So one of their points was in the aerospace industry, it's long been accepted or a point that, um, to a large degree, you need to go where the work is. And that can be unfortunate for families and people that like the area that they live in, but it also seems to be a reality. So um, so that's kind of where I'm at. If anybody knows of anything, shoot me an email or, or um, if anybody knows of any place they're just hiring like crazy, I'd certainly like to know that because yeah. I, I see I see postings on the internet. I see, it just seems that there's a lot of jobs out there, but don't have a lot of offers rolling in the door. Yeah. Are you associated with the AAA in Tucson? Um, yeah, I, I think my membership actually expires probably about right now, but I've been a member of AAA ever since the, you know, like the 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of the, if, if you know of a guy out at airports, a uh, little bit of static there. Yeah, there's a guy out there at Air Force Research Laboratories in Ohio. He's the chief engineer now, or the head engineer. His name's Bradley Leapst. And he was, he was our, he was the mentor, if you will, back, you know, in my early days of college. And um, whenever, you, whenever you take a test by... Professor Leapst, you need to make sure that you study a plenty, plenty of other tests and exams in the test file. And AIAA was one of the places that had a really good test file. And he really encouraged everybody to join AIAA. And, and um, I think it's a really good organization to join. It, yeah. it seems that over the years, and in, in particular over the past five years or so, it seems to have improved even better than what it has been in the past. Yeah. You might yeah. want to, um, in Tucson, uh, Michelle is the, um, the chapter s section president there. Might want to yeah, I know. I know Michelle. Yeah. Maybe just talk to her. She might have, uh, she knows a lot of people, so. Yeah, I've. It's been a long time since I've chatted with her, but I know, yeah, I know. And I don't know, I, I don't even know when they had elections last, but I just heard that she was the Tucson section chair. Right. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I'd start with her because, you know, again, like in LA and like Seth was saying, you know, it's like, this is, um, NAA is kind of a center of gravity that maybe there's an NSS chapter there you know, this kind of just gets you uh, mingling with the uh, leading organizations, so. Yeah, there is, actually, I should say there is an NSS chapter there, and actually, uh, the L5 Society, one of the predecessor organizations to NSS, was actually founded in Tucson. So there is a major NSS presence. Yeah, so I'd start shaking those trees, you know. What is the NSS? I, forgive my... Um incredible naivety but oh uh, um, national, I'm not... national space society that was the organization i was talking about before that i was also involved with oh okay and so then they are um now national i know michelle she does a lot of things related to her artwork um and i i don't know if this national space, space society if they're more technically oriented or or not or if there's any um i don't know if there's maybe there's not any relationship there but i know they had there was an event over at um one of the resorts here in town where they invited a whole bunch you know like they invited buzz aldrin out here 
and I think I, now that you say that, I think I heard about National Space Society. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not aware of technical involvement by any organization other than AIAA is. You, know, you just never know, you know, the members, uh, you know, like Seth, Seth's very technical and he belongs to NSS, so you just never know what you'll find, so. Yeah, I, I find that um, NSS is good in that, um, in that it's, while it's oriented for the amateur space enthusiasts, students, teachers, and so on, um, in places where there is a lot of aerospace industry present, you also get a lot of professionals. So it's not so much technical, but it is a way of getting to know people. And before you know it, you're, you're being invited to give talks by the NSS chapter, and then, you know, you'll catch people's eye that way. So it's kind of, you know, technically you'll be a kind of a bigger fish there in a way. And so, uh, you know, the members themselves might not be as many technical people, but it's a little bit more of an informal flavor. And um, it's, um, it's an organization where anyone who basically is willing to show up and do a little bit of volunteer work for the chapter can rise quickly in terms of visibility. Mm, yeah, I think that kind of tends to be um, how it is in the Tucson chapter. Although in the Tucson chapter, I think things are a little bit more parochial. Um, there seems to be a little, a little bit of that kind of thing going on. Yeah, but you never know. Just start, you know, I suggest just start digging in and you know, if you come up with nothing after a year of getting involved, then there's probably nothing there. Yeah, that's how, uh, um, just with my situation, which I hope is unique, um, uh, just there was a situation I was in, I alluded to, and Michelle was in no way, uh, Part of that she might have heard about it but it's like she wasn't there. but um yeah I've, I've been struggling in tucson so like i say i probably need to uh if i'm gonna stay aerospace i probably need to look elsewhere before i would ever go back to or could ever go back to raytheon i think and and having the no security clearance at the present time is partially you know, um, partially responsible for their due to that. Uh, Barry, I actually had was contacted recently by a, a Raytheon recruiter, and um, she, uh, I sent her a resume, and she's she was um, dealing with positions um, in various different places, and I think maybe Massachusetts and Texas. Um, I don't think Tucson was one of them. Um, and the only place in California she was dealing with was Fullerton, which for me is about is a long commute, but I could do it. Um, but um, I actually am uh, just about 20 minutes away from the, um, the um, Raytheon El Segundo facility. And, um, but it, um, what I gathered from that was they are hiring. Now my clearance situation is I had a clearance but when I left full-time industry, uh, my clearance became inactive, and it's now been inactive about three years, so I would have to be re-cleared. But the fact that they're even talking to me, even though I don't have a current clearance, is a good sign. Oh, wow. Could you send me the name of your recruiter or your contact uh, information? Yeah, um, and uh, I'll uh, look. But um, can you send me an email? Um, and... Um, I'll, uh, my email address is sethpotter3 at gmail.com and I'll reply to you with the name. Seth, uh, is that just Seth Potter, S-E-T-H-P-O-T-T-E-R? That's right, three, no periods, at gmail.com. Okay. Great. Now I love it. This is uh, why we're all together tonight uh, for kind of connections. So. Yeah. It's terrific. You know, just FYI, you guys will... Yeah, you guys will be interested in this. Does does anybody here know? Um, we all know what X twenty nine is, right? The X twenty nine plane. Uh, I may know it by some other name. It was the wing. It was the plane that was developed um, back in the eighties. Oh, the forward swept. And wing. it had forward swept. Yeah, oh, I yeah. remember that. Yeah, I forgot that it was the X twenty nine. And right. so then. It was also experimental in that um, 
it had wings that, you know, normally when you, when a wing encounters a gust, it kind of tends to pitch up. Well, this plane was one of the first ones to experiment with uh, composite materials. And when it encountered a gust, it also not only a pitch up, but it had a tendency for the leading edge of the wing to pitch down and for the wing to kind of curve. Well, anyway, the flight controls for that were exceedingly difficult. And I happen to know that because the guy that was the lead, uh, the lead control guy, you know, like the guy at the very top, the guy that was calling the technical shots, that was a guy named Dale Enns. And he's at Honeywell now, but he was my professor at the time. And um, one of his, I had him, or I asked him to write a pitch for the local AIAA chapter here. And the pitch that he wrote for AIAA was phenomenal. Um, you know, he just, uh, I can forward it to anybody that wants it, but because I think Dale, I don't know where he's at in his career. I'm, he's got to be close to retirement someplace. But um, his, uh, his support of AIAA was no holding back. And just uh, his point was jump in with two feet. And um, he, he mentioned something about having the, his Journal of Guidance Control and Dynamics and keeping every copy and still referring to them over, over after all these years and things. <laughs> He's a little bit unique. But just my point is, is, it was a guy, he was a guy that was that high up technically, and he had a nothing bad. He had everything, all kinds of kudos and accolades to say about membership in the AAA over the long term. Great. That was a great organization. So, mm -hmm. some big differences. Anyway, um, so appreciate all that, Barry. So, See a few more folks on here. Uh, anyone else want to tell their story or um, interested in scanning their line of work and seeing if someone on here is, you know, can connect that for them or anything like that? Is that Douglas? Hi, Marty. Yes. Hi. Hi. We, we've not met, but I certainly know Seth from various uh, interactions with the AIA and, of course, uh, Ken Louie. Um, there are a lot of images that are coming from the space station this evening, and uh, I'm, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm not in the aerospace business, but I've had the good pleasure of introducing my film to the AIAA. <clears throat> um, it's, been, they had, it's a screening that they had here in Long Beach, um, just uh, about a year and change. And um, the good news is I went to a, a, one of the seminars that Ken put on, with a wonderful artist named Mark Pastana, who's also a um, test pilot for NASA. And his whole talk was about the space station. And by the time the smoke cleared, it turned out he was a huge Bonestell fan. And the film was called Chesley Bonestell, A Brush with the Future. It's a documentary. It's the, f the first one of its kind about Chesley. And um, by Jove, it's on the space station now, thanks to Mark and the AIAA, I'm really grateful. So it's, it's been up there for a couple of weeks for the crew to watch, and uh, <clears throat> if it all works out, I will have that film up there for quite a while for all the new crews to come and see it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't know who Chesley Bonestell is, he's a space artist, he's no longer with us. He lived from 1888 to 1986. He was involved in an incredible amount of historical projects. He worked on the Chrysler Building in New York City. He worked on the Golden Gate Bridge. He was an architect and artist by trade. And uh, he did a series of paintings uh, after he worked in Hollywood as a map painter. He did special effects for Citizen Kane, War of the Worlds, um, and uh, of course the big one is Destination Moon. But he also did uh, a series of paintings of what it's like to visit um, planets in our solar system. And these paintings were published in Life magazine in 1944, and they ultimately became the impetus for our space program. And uh, I, he worked with Werner von Braun and Willie Ley. He's kind of a very lost, almost forgotten American hero. 
And I'd like to say Chesley Bonestell is the man who helped get us to the moon, not with technology, but with a paintbrush. Because he was able to take complicated algorithms, formulas, drawings and all that, and put them into, made them beautiful renderings and paintings that just inspired so many people. He has a painting called Saturn is seen from Titan that he painted in 1944 for uh, Life oh. magazine. And um, that painting is known as this, <clears throat> this is the painting that's launched a thousand careers. And we're talking about people that were inspired to get together and head up to the final frontier of outer space. So uh, it's a great honor to be up there um, in the space station. <laughs> filmically at least, and um, uh, we're working on distribution of the film so that uh, the world can see it also. Wow. And um, th that's, uh, I'm, I'm especially grateful to the AIA because it just wouldn't have happened if I hadn't connected up with them. Yeah. Hey, Particularly you... Marcus Donna, great, great gentleman. Mark is, a, Mark is an artist who was, whose career was launched by Bonnetel and also, um, He's, uh, he was heavily involved in the assembly of the space station, um, of course, when they put it all together in the year 2000. So that's um, a, a little bit different slant for the evening, but it ties into these wonderful images that are being uh, shown um, as part of this party. Appreciate it. Can you maybe spell his name again, please? I'm yeah, sorry. it's uh, Chesley, C-H-E-S-L-E-Y. And, um, the uh, last name is Bonestell. That's B-O-N-E-S-T-E-L-L. -L. Chesley Bonestell. Um, I will shamelessly plug my website. If you go to www.chesleybonestell.com, we have all kinds of information about the film, and clips, and oh, great. great things that you'll enjoy reading, and all kinds of information about Chesley himself. That's awesome. chesleybonestell.com. Wow, wow. And he died in when, uh, the 80s, you said? Uh, he was born in 1888, and he died in 1986 at the age of 98. Wow, wow. And that he was means... still still painting up to the very end. Wow. Oh. I will go to your website. It's terrific. Thank you. Great information. Yeah, we have, a, we have a newsletter. And also, I think if Ken can chime in, there's a, we have an article about putting the film on the space station coming up for the, you know, that's going to be in one of the AIAA uh, publications. Oh, great. So, you, you know, even though you said that you're not in aerospace, you, like you really are, that's, that's, <laughs> it's been a great interest of yours, or else you would have done a documentary on something not related to aerospace. <laughs> oh, I, I had rockets when I was a kid and, yeah. uh, I had firecrackers blowing things up and putting, you know, how to, <laughs> how to send firecrackers through a rocket over the fence to uh, the oh. neighbors. And um, yeah, I had a wonderful, wonderful youth. Um, I got to uh, take in Ray Bradbury's books and uh, wow. watch shows like Men in the Space. And uh, it's a great thrill in the film. It's just some extraordinary footage. Uh, all kinds of people that include Ray Bradbury himself talking about Chesley Bonestell. It's um, really a, a feast for those who know Chesley and uh, for those who don't, um, you'll, you'll love it too. And yeah. wow. I, get, I get at screenings and we've had a few, we've been at the Smithsonian um, and we've won awards like the best documentary at Comic-Con in San Diego. Mm. Um, wow. And the, we won Best Documentary at the Boston Science Fiction Film Festival. Uh, so the, the really cool thing is people come up to me before the film is even run and they say, thank you for making this film. And I said, well, well you should wait to see what it looks like. And then afterwards, uh, people will come up to me and say, after having seen the film, they go, how come I never heard of this man before? Yeah. So he's a, a timeless, fascinating gentleman and I look forward to making him available to the world soon. Wow. Oh, terrific. Well, really glad you came on here. So yeah, tell us about this. I can't believe I haven't heard of him. Probably now I'll like go through some of my stuff and I'll see I have some pictures or 
right? You know, magazine <laughs> clippings. Yeah, you'll him. recognize his work. It's yeah. pretty, pretty unforgettable. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, anybody have any questions for Douglas on this, or um... I, I can put in a couple of uh, words here. The I, I happen to be in attendance at the AIAA meeting in Long Beach. And I saw the film, and Doug was there. I don't recognize him now, but uh, that was a fantastic film. And the story of Chesley Bonestell was just so amazing. Some of the images that he painted, it was like, wow, if that didn't raise the imagination and the desire to get into space that a lot of people, I don't know what would have. I remember seeing some of those as a young kid. And it was like, wow, when will that ever happen? When will a rocket ever take off vertically and land vertically again? And you know what? It's finally happening now. So that's pretty neat stuff. <laughs> um, I can't tell who just said those wonderful comments, of course. Um, oh, this, this is uh, George. I, the, um, I was there and it, it happened that I took some images of you guys up on the stage with my iPhone. And, and then you said, oh, can we get some of those images? And I sent them back oh. to you at the time. Okay. So you're George Robinson? Yes, right. Okay, great. Well, thanks for doing that. And um, well, thank you for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, feel free to write in with those comments and we can put them on our website. We have a newsletter that we're always uh, love to send out and spread the word. People can know when their screenings or what's going on. And um, we've got, um, if we can ever get back to showing films in front of live audiences, there's a screening planned at the University of California at Riverside um in november and my son works for spacex he's also <clears throat> a graduate of the ucr school of engineering uh hopefully the two of us will be able to share the stage there we'll see but um you know it's um spacex has a lot of restrictions on what their people can do and cannot do so um no promises but the screening is it'll, it'll be available again the website chesleybonestell.com will keep you important. Great. That's terrific. Thanks, George, for uh, the good words and for actually coming to the film in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't stay away. <laughs> nice. So, um, anyone else have some story or um, anything you're working on you want to share with the group? Feel free. I don't even know what time it is. I know we got a late start. It's like eight. <laughs> Everybody good for I don't know, fifteen more minutes or so, or does that work? As long as you're not on the East Coast. <laughs> so good. So yeah, there's a bunch. Just about everybody's muted on here. And if you can't see everybody, just kind of drag. Uh, the, the window in it, it'll populate there. It looks like on here there's um, 12, 13 people. So if you don't see 13 squares, um, then you know, you're not viewing the, the whole thing. So, okay. So anyway, um, yeah, the old question, anyone want to speak next? Just um, why don't you start talking, you won't even know you're talking. So it's, it's pretty easy. <clears throat> um, okay. uh, did anybody on here, you don't have to talk, you can raise your hand. Uh, see the uh, Yuri's Night uh, stuff. It, it's still on. I hear it going in the other room. Um, yeah, it's still going on. Um, I, I have it on the background with the sound off. Uh, there's um, the host is um, interviewing um, Robert Picardo from Star Trek Voyager. Apparently, he's active in the Planetary Society, and um, so they were talking a little bit about that and. Um, now that I'm watching it, you know, I'm seeing we maybe we should have pushed more for an AIAA and an NSS presence at this, but, you know, maybe there was one earlier that I didn't know about. So, um, you know, because they, they basically started, according to the, the, um, the, the 
flyer on Facebook. They started at 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time and are ending it at 12.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So it's... <laughs> oh, really? Oh, so yeah. it's... Awesome. I don't know if the same awesome. host is, is the same young lady who's on there now is, is running it for eight and a half hours. But, um, awesome. you know, it's one of these things where maybe they want to give everyone in the world a chance to log on at some point. Yes, yeah, so that was Loretta Whitesides was uh, started it off. So I yeah, can't... Yeah, no, it doesn't look like Loretta at this point. It's somebody else. Okay. All right. Oh. Yeah, it's a great program. I, uh, I thought it was going to finish up just before we began here. I didn't know that they have it scheduled for eight hours. So I guess I'll be able to find <laughs> people that are on tonight. So we've got, got a little ways to go. But yeah, it's a worldwide audience too. So uh, the sun's coming up in some places, where, you know, by the time it's midnight here. So. Hey, uh, Marty, I'm, I'm assuming it's kind of, it looks like it's kind of a one way thing. Of course, my TV doesn't have a camera and microphone, but uh, I don't think there's, I don't think one can really participate in it. Uh, not, not from what I saw before, unless they're opening it up. Uh, if they do that, they stand the risk of aliens attacking them. So Yeah, that's true. <laughs> But can our, uh, what are those things called, the cloaking device or the, our phaser yeah. fields and... Uh, proton torpedo. Troy, that's proton torpedo. Yeah, proton torpedo. <laughs> that well. I was under the impression there were two people on doing that, but I guess it was only one because, unless did you, how many did you block? I think I blocked five of them. Because really? I blocked two, two or three yeah. and they're still, Keep coming, and uh, you know, I think they keep creating fake names uh, and uh, try to you know uh, uh, infiltrate. Yeah. So I have to. So I, I almost broke up Barry because it looks a little bit strange. So initially I didn't, but once it's uh, you know quiet, I, I just get Barry back in. Yeah. So it's like five, huh? Yeah, I think they, I think it's the same one or two person they keep creating fake names. Oh, okay. Interesting. So I brought two. I thought it's okay. Then they put another one in, and uh, they they keep doing that. Yeah, maybe if you can get me their information, so I make sure that I don't invite them to future events. Okay, I, okay. I, even if uh, they were on my list, you know, they could have just uh, spread spread like who yeah, knows? Some, somebody yeah. could have got a legitimate one and sent it to a friend of theirs who was interested, and then that person might have sent it to someone bad. Yeah, you just have no way to tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's very strange. Yeah. But part of being in space. <laughs> That's right. It's a, it's a harsh environment. We, we yeah. had a little uh, pinhole leak in the space station here. So That's we got right. attacked. So, but we survived. Thanks yeah, to yeah. Ken's uh, quick action and expertise and uh, troubleshooting real time. That, that wasn't easy. <laughs> Very strange. Uh, yeah. So, I think Steve, Steve raised a hand. Yeah, I have a note, a historical note. Why are we holding Yuri's night on April 11th this year when the actual date of Yuri's flight and the event was April 12th? The simple answer is. Tomorrow, April 12th, is Easter Sunday. Well, from my understanding, April 12th was his first flight, was his flight. It's yeah, his April 12th, 1961. But the Russians wouldn't care, the Soviets wouldn't care, because they were a bunch, a bunch of atheists. Right, I don't know if it always falls on uh, Easter weekend. But anyway, it's always April, you know, it was April 12th. Yeah, yeah, 12th. 12th. yeah, when the 12th falls on like a Saturday night, they'll have it on the 12th. There's been some oh. time, I think it's been like on a, April 12th, it's been on a Wednesday. So that's like a real problem back when uh -huh. people used to go to work. <laughs> so they don't, they'd move it to either the preceding or oh, following. Oh. Set yeah. typically on a Saturday because yeah, it's a live event. Saturday night. Yeah, just because it's a party night. Yeah, yeah, and and all the events were live. Um, shouldn't say all, but probably ninety nine percent were live events. So they they 
you know, people are going to be around till midnight, and if the next day was a work day, that that was difficult. So <laughs> let's stay moved. I'm, to do oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Now go ahead. Uh -huh. That's all I wanted to say. Um, Marty, uh, a couple of updates. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, in LA, at least in recent years, they tended to do that on the nearest Saturday. Some cities do it on the actual day. I think I remember years oh. ago, the LA Yuri's Night was in a like a small club venue in Hollywood. And um, oh. it was actually on the night. And it was more in the spirit of a rave in that it was not publicized, of course, this was like 20 years ago and the web wasn't quite as big a thing then and there they, they there was a little bit of a mystique about it and um and then in recent years they've had it at the california science center in the where the oh, yeah. on display by the way an update um uh, on uh the the global yuri's night uh, loretta did come back on she announced that they're going into their final segment and that she uh they awarded the yuri's spirit of yuri's night award to duran duran um, because apparently they gave a concert at the Kennedy Space Center. I don't know if this was at a, a Yuri's Night or what the occasion was, but apparently the band has promoted space, so they got the spirit oh, of Yuri's Night. Oh. oh, interesting. So they didn't give it to Elton John this year for a rocket man, huh? No, but, you know, I always thought, you know, coming of age and being, I guess, being in high school when that song came out, and I had just read the Ray Bradbury song, Rocket Man, and I thought, this sounds familiar. And later on, I actually did read that the song was based on the Ray Bradbury story, that the, the resemblance was intentional. Oh, yeah. oh. Wow, didn't know that. Great little piece of trivia for Yuri's Night. Appreciate yep. it. <laughs> so, great. Okay, so like in our last few minutes here, um, who wants to say something? A little bit, a little bit about your interest, career. Um, if you enjoyed Yuri's night tonight, you meet some interesting people on here. I don't know if there's someone talking or is that the, somebody's computer in the background? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's Yuri's night, the other Yuri's night. So, well, uh, Marty, I thought you want to talk about the STS zero one. I thought you mentioned you you want to talk about it, STS. The the first shuttle flight. Yeah, yeah. I thought you mentioned you will talk about it. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, so April 12th, and I guess they <clears throat> planned it that way. As you know, the uh, first shuttle flight got delayed many times uh, due to tile issues and whatever. Very complex, large vehicle. I still don't know how all the pieces of it stick together and launches and goes as fast as it does. It's a truly incredible vehicle. But uh, let's delay it because was the uh, tile issue. So um, I don't know when it was first supposed to launch, maybe 79 or 80. It took, it took I think, about a year, year and a half more. But anyway, the, so it ended up being on April 12th of 81. Oh, yeah. And this was, that was a, uh, I'm assuming just probably just about everybody on here saw that. And um, I couldn't believe it that, you know, it was this whole concept that it was a totally unproven vehicle that they were putting people in for the first time at launch. That hadn't happened before, at least like with Mercury and Gemini um, and Apollo, even Apollo flew uncrewed a number of times. Um, and, you know, Mercury and the Atlas, that, Booster was ICBM tested many times, as well as the Titan II. So at least they had some flight history on those vehicles. So here the shuttle comes along, and none of it, like zero of it, had been flight tested. It had been ground tested, like uh, burning the solid rocket boosters and 
So, but this kind of shows what the uh, new computer age was able to do because it flew in simulation. Uh, Rockwell and Downey, they had the flight, there's how flight, it was the FSL, and I forget the S stood for systems or simulation, I think it was simulation lab. And um, they flew it many times in simulation, but never, ever in reality. So I remember when that launched the first time, the fact that they got it right, it's unbelievable. And all they had was a couple of, uh, might've been some other tiles, but the ones we could see were on the back of the Ohms pods. A couple of them uh, came off during launch. So it was all this concern about, is that gonna be dangerous because it's not heat protected, but it's fortunate um, that those were on top where there's not much plasma going on and the heating isn't that intense. But still, it wasn't good. I remember the, this whole theory is about, oh, since there's no tiles in these few places, the others are going to, you know, unpeel because of the heat getting in there. So I guess that's possible. That could have happened, that could have happened but it's fortunate that the ones that were lost were, like, just around the corner oh, from where, where that was critical. Well, we've got a little sound back. Nothing like the Klingons. Before. Yeah, I think that's George, George's uh, wife or something. <laughs> friendly Klingons. This is friend, friendly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that uh, first launch was, uh, I tell you, yeah, I watched it. I couldn't believe it. It was like magic that it worked right the first time. Unbelievable effort and coordination between contractors and interfaces. Can you imagine all the interface drawings that had to work and be so precise? Um, it's unreal, just unreal that they pulled it off like they did. All the systems you think of the, the uh, life support systems on board the orbiter and the payload bay doors and the thermal heating on those, even those payload bay doors were. Uh, like they were wondering if you open them up, are they gonna get warped from the temperature change and, and they wouldn't be able to close them and then they wouldn't be able to get them back. It's like all that stuff, they figured out all that stuff and modeled it back with ancient computers in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. They figured all this stuff out and flew it within software and it all worked and you know, there, there are a number of modifications along the way. They upgraded it to a glass cockpit when those came about. So many things. But the, the underlying core vehicle itself was an incredible, solid design. And they got it right the first time. So to me, that, that just speaks volumes for all the, the people in design and engineering that, that made that happen. Just incredible. And then ironically the two vehicles that were lost were kind of from bad decisions not by the design folks but uh, by those operating it um, with the challenger they knew there's many books out on this um, you know the whole o-ring issue and stenciled right on those boosters is the operating temperature I forgot what they are, but yeah, I got some pictures I'd taken up close. And right there, right on the boosters, is like, you know, only use it between this temperature and this temperature. And they totally violated that when they launched it that day. Oh, yeah. It wasn't a design issue that we lost the first one. And then the, the next one with the tiles coming off and the ice, it's like, you know, um, that was not... It, it was, you know, you learn as you go. And unfortunately, they didn't pay enough attention. There were enough warnings on other flights that there was damage and tiles coming off and um, that it could have damaged the leading edge of the wing, but they didn't address that. The program was too much on a fast track for having to live up to its reputation to sell it to Congress. You know, they probably had all these promises, like I think it was like a flight a week or two flights a month or something. <laughs> so they had to sell it to get it funded, you know, to, with these kind of unrealistic operational expectations. And 
they they went like crazy to keep up with that schedule and they did very well but um now it was the first time they had two shuttles on the pad on pad a and pad b and they were behind on uh, columbia uh, they were behind on columbia they were behind on challenger and um but um kind of going between the flights but, but basically their their operational things that got violated that they knew about and you did need to be able to take a time out and address what brought down Columbia, but they, they didn't. They stayed on that fast track and uh, it's just unfortunate. So, but as far as the design of the vehicle, couldn't have been better. Uh, just mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of going around a big circle on April 12th for the first orbiter flight. I'm just still astounded that they, they got that right. And, um, first time and it worked unbelievable so mm -hmm. they did have safety measures on the first four flights a crew escape system right. uh, just ejection seats for each of the two crew members yeah yeah so but the, you know that, that that was for ascent but say if they couldn't have closed the pale of bay doors or they lost too many heat bearing tiles that that wouldn't have helped them but for ascent, yeah. you know that was important but yeah they never use it the other thing about that program it's like there's never been another program like it where after only four flights it was declared operational and that was a problem right there it's probably the most experimental you know, you got like people flying around their home built airplanes and they're experimental. And, uh, you know, some people have thousands of hours on their home built airplanes and they're experimental. Here, the space shuttle was experimental for only the first four flights, the most complex flying machine ever built. A miracle that they did it. And it was declared as an operational system on the fifth mission. And right there, that's actually set up the failure for when the Columbia uh, burned up on reentry. Because right there, the whole operational thing, you philosophy, you don't get into too much R and D and troubleshooting. You know, you look at the 737 Max. It's like they had to lose two of them before they dug into it. They didn't. You know, probably people were looking at it with the first after the first crash, but they didn't stop them from flying. So it took two disasters to interrupt that operational program. And 737 has many, many hours on it. And that variation, um, they kept on going after the first disaster. So uh, just the nature of operational programs, you, you don't go back engineering them too much once it turned into operational. And unfortunately, the space shuttle was put in that category, unbelievable after only four experimental flights. Recipe for disaster. Anyway, that answer your question, Ken? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. It happened to be on the same same day. Yeah. Hey, um, Vince, can I just make a comment about that too? Uh huh. Um, yeah, this is Barry. If you think back, you know there was um, similar thinking about you know the Apollo program, mm -hmm. and what was it the first or the I think it was the yeah, that, that's right. When they first landed on the moon, and then when they were going around the moon, you can maybe recall some of the uh, the classic footage of that um, on film. It was reported that they expected a safe return of, I think it was like 50%. Right, yeah. <laughs> and so um, now they had a I don't know that they necessarily considered it operational at that point in time, but but they were certainly they were proceeding that way as though it were operational. Well, and, yeah. well I got to believe with a space shuttle, even though they declared it operational, um, got to believe that their safety margins were significantly different than they are um, today. Yeah. Um on the um, what is on the uh, Artemis uh, flight profile, it will have one uncrewed flight followed by the first crewed flight into lunar orbit, 
and then the third flight will land on the moon. So there's got to be a lot of com computer simulation. Yeah. And you look at the computers we have today compared to in the 70s, it's like, you know, it's a lot more confidence that your simulation will be correct. There's so much data. Yeah. You know, it, it's a totally different world now. Computer simulation. They, they, I don't even know how they simulate it. It was all proprietary software, I'm sure. You know, and, and computers that were built at Rockwell would do that. So um, not standard for everybody, anybody to buy by any means. So... Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, Marty, one of the ways that they do that is, um, you know, they'll, they'll do it piecemeal so that at the very beginning, they might have a covariance simulation. And then as things go along, then they'll increase the fidelity of one simulation, but then um, for one thing, but then also have a simulation for another thing, and then later on another thing. So then they'll they'll take all these piecemeal simulations eventually and start um, putting things together. And if you think about from a system engineering perspective, one of the things that they like to do um, is be able to take all of those piecemeal things, not just for simulations, but for everything else too. But in the model-based system engineering, they're trying to... Um, merge things like that and put, put all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. But um, the overall simulation effort, when you account for everything, it's incredibly complex, typically not even the same language, mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly involved in much higher level of fidelity today than it has been in the past. Yeah, that's unbelievable. So, great, well, that was a great conversation. So. Um, so I'll ask, uh, give anyone one last opportunity here. Anybody else want to say something? <clears throat> uh, Mar Marty, Marty. Uh huh. Um, I actually somebody sent me a, um, a, a like a, a short week, uh, clip of video. Uh, some astronomer took a video of the moon. Uh, oh. the, some, they 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 claim they saw something on the moon flying. Uh, but since you you are and people here are aerospace uh, uh, you know experts, do you want to take a quick good look and to see what's your professional you know opinion? Do you think it's okay to yeah. show it? Good. If Buzz Aldrin took it, then it's got to be real. <laughs> okay. The, the, I don't know if it's Buzz. I don't. I don't. I think somebody in Quebec in Canada. Okay. Let me play this. Just one second. Okay. Yeah. Somebody sent it to me. And uh, I, I sent it to some AIW member. I don't oh. haven't got the. Uh, you know, you guys expert, you can uh, see how how it how it looks. Hmm. Just a second. Okay. Hmm. Wrong time. I right, take a little time to load because of that bandwidth. Yeah, I think it's, uh, but it's very short. Just one second. One thing I real, one thing on this, are you paying for me? Okay, but let me, let me try.
the only one that would. Right. Take your kid. Take your camera off and see if it helps it. <laughs> yeah, because this video is interesting because it looks like it's some funny thing, but you know, uh, but uh, you know, uh, spacecraft. This also looks very strange. Well, if it doesn't work, you you can send me the link. I okay, guess. let me try this 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 way. One second. Give it one more try. I'm gonna do a bathroom run real quick. Now yeah, look it's at the, going now. Yeah, look at the surface. Look at the surface. They claim that some amateur uh, astronomer took this. Hmm. You see the little dot there? They even have shadow. Did anybody see it? Yeah. No way for Marty to see it again. All right, I'm back. Okay, well, we'll play it for you. Oh, see, I left and you got it working. <laughs> Did you see the little dot on the uh, moon surface? Yeah. yeah. Those little dots, they look like they could be um, some some form of, you know, asteroid, whatever you call it on the, on the moon, but uh, something that could be impacting um, impacting the moon, just like an asteroid would impact, uh, a small asteroid would impact Earth, because you'll notice right there where they're going down, the surface of the moon is also very shiny, just just like those little dots, they're very shiny. What's what's the source of the video? What, what was it taken with? Who took it? Is that some uh, telescope at home, or what? Yeah, this is what I'm trying to figure out. It, you see the date there, and it says it's uh, uh, like an amateur astronomer taken from Quebec, Canada. Yeah, so it could have been anything. that could have been dust on his but You see there's shadow on the moon. I don't see any shadow on the moon. Oh, OK. okay. Uh, Let me pull it back. Do you see the little dot there? Uh, if you can point to it. OK. It's like a, you see the, the pointer here is coming up at the lower bottom. Okay. The two and then it's three and then you see the shadow below below beneath it. No. You didn't see it? Oh I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link. You don't see the white dot? There are three of them. Well yeah, but it could be anything. Oh, it could be anything. Okay. But how could the astronomer took this? I think it's too high resolution. Well, you know, it could have been light reflecting into their telescope or, you know, anything. You know, if this is a amateur telescope, that it's zoomed out. You know, I've, I've done that with my telescopes, you know, to see that. Yeah, you see, this is the dot he was saying. There it is, yeah. Yeah, and on the surface, you can see the shadow. So it looks like it's something on the moon's surface. Yeah. There's the shadows going across, yeah. It's yeah. wild. It's very strange. Yeah, but it could be reflection. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So I just you know put it up for like your yeah. uh, like opinion. Yeah, I'd say you know that that telescope just kind of going on memory from my telescope. See how that is really zoomed out it's to be able to get that. Yeah, really zoomed. Uh, you know, a lot of power to get that that kind of resolution with the crater. Yeah, and you know when you when everything is amplified when you have that much magnification going on, especially through our atmosphere, there's just so many things that could you know could be 
you know, some bugs flying across the yeah. open telescope. That's what I thought, yeah. Or some birds or something. I, but how come I, the shadow is on the, on the surface of the moon? Well, I don't know if the shadow's on the surface. It's just, it's, it's, that's where the mark is showing up. It looks like it's on the moon, but it, it's the same okay. way, like, you know, like when you look up at night, so, you know, all the stars you see are that with your eye are within our galaxy. And it's like if you're looking at another galaxy with a telescope and you have, you know, you're going to see all these other stars, but they're, they're in the way as you're looking out through our galaxy. It's like there's, there's so many contaminants that, that could be reflecting. I agree. Uh, that, that, you know, if you don't specify the equipment, those things, it's very, yeah. yeah, very strange. Yeah. So I feel this is very nice. I just played for fun. You know, you know if this was um, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, where we have, you know, a lot of confidence in, in the... That's right. This uh, is, you cannot characterize it. And it's very dangerous. Right. Very strange. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's amateur thing. And it's great the way he zoomed in, but... You could, you could pick up so many reflections from so many ways. That's right. Um, yeah. When doing that, and it will come across appearing like it's a, something in a shadow, but it, it could be the way the light reflects, the same way it re refracts. You know, you've seen like, um, you know, the way you get like a prism kind of effect sometimes with light, and, and you'll have a part of that color somewhere and then then like a foot further down it, there's another aspect of it because it's it's being diffracted so is, is the lro still in orbit around the moon yeah but you'd never ever be able to see that from the earth you know, you know yeah. whatever you know there are things orbiting the moon i think some of uh, the apollo ascent stages are yeah, you know, lunar module ascent stages are still orbiting the moon, but there's no way you could ever pick it up, pick that up with a amateur telescope. That's right. So, That's why I feel very strange. Yeah, you yeah. just never, never could pick that up. Yeah, I, this, this is very strange. So I, you know, I always thought it's fake, you know, but it could be some optical thing you said. You know? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's purposely fake, and maybe the person who, who's sent that in, believed that it was something. So, but um, you would never be able to see that kind of resolution. Yeah. You know, with amateur thing, and for him to be pointing that telescope at the moon at that time to get, you know, he just so happened to shoot that video. Yeah, very bizarre. Well, it's, 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 you just can't do that. I know, I know. It's, That's why know, I feel very fishy. Yeah. But again, yeah, if it was like Hubble or something, you know, reliable kind that's of right, source yeah. that's characterized and you, you know its properties and it's sitting outside of the atmosphere and not subject to any <clears> kind <throat> of refraction or reflections or anything from our our atmosphere, and then, then that's a whole different thing. Yeah, you see there's a lot of fluctuation there, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there's that video, that famous video from Apollo 11, where Buzz Aldrin thought that they were being followed by something. And he actually shot video out the window of the command module. Yeah. And it turns out it was the, um, the panels that, came, that surrounded the lunar module. They had gone off on whatever orbit, you know, from their velocity, and they were far away. And he didn't realize it at the time, but that's, that's right, what yeah. that was. That's right, so, yeah. So... You know, so that's a case where something real and, you know, just in the excitement of the mission and everything they're doing, he probably just didn't think about that that's what it could have been. He figured that those panels ended up somewhere else and not being so close to them. Um, so, that's right. uh, and they were pretty far, but still he zoomed in on it and he said, hey, it looks like we're being followed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, so uh, you, you're saying there was something orbiting on the moon? Uh, some satellite orbiting the moon right now? Well, there's, um, um, I know they crashed the ascent stages in on, on a number of the flights, but I think 
I might be wrong, but I think Apollo 11's ascent stage is still orbiting the moon. Okay. Sure. Uh, it'd be easy to find out on the internet. I just don't know offhand, but there's probably one or two ascent stages. I think Apollo 11 is still orbiting the moon. I see. Well, that's why I was asking about the lunar reconnaissance orbiter, but I think your analysis is just right. It, it is so far away, even though you can see satellites in Earth orbit, to see a satellite yeah. from a distance of the moon, yeah. a very yeah. high resolution requirement. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I feel. It's too strange. You know, it's yeah. too high resolution. It's not possible that way. Yeah, and to have his, it's not easy aiming a camera through a telescope. <laughs> you know, I've, I've taken pictures through my telescopes, and you pick up all kind of, to get that thing seated on there just right so it doesn't pick up any reflection or refractions from anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. And to, to just so happen to be shooting video as you're looking at the moon, and that happen to see it. Yeah. By, it's like that right there. I, I would say it again. It's like I'm giving them benefit of the doubt that yeah, yeah. it was something, but I think what it was was refraction or reflection coming through his telescope somehow from some local conditions, and that makes sense why it was simultaneous with him shooting that video because that's when he was shooting that video and. He would pick up disturbances like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, he's gonna be pointing to the moon. Yeah, the chance. Yeah, it's a very, and that looks like something orbiting around the moon. You know, uh, take that kind of picture. You know, it's yeah. not possible. It's too close. Well, yeah, the you know, NASA would love to have that instrument. <laughs> yeah, if, if exactly. You know, we yeah. spend all this money on these exotic telescopes to. Uh, Never even, I don't even think the Hubble Space Telescope could pick that up. That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah, it just, it's not. Yeah, not, yeah. Uh, I understand. I understand. But yeah, if it was the Hubble and it's like, it just so happened and that thing's always scanning stuff. So that has a better chance of, you know, they might have it looking at the moon for an hour. And, you know, of course, they're recording everything. So, uh, yeah, in that case, yeah. No, it's just not possible. Yeah, that, that's why I feel it's good. You know, the AIW, you know, people professional. You know, you know, some people will have some kind of strange stuff, you know, then you can debunk, you know, explain to them what's the yeah. science, you know. So yeah. that's why the AIW is good at, you know, that's yeah. what expert and, like and you. And another thing, if, if that thing was big enough to create a shadow like that, um, we're, we're probably <laughs> in trouble because something big is going to hit the earth very soon. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's very oh. big. You know, if it's some remnants from a comet that's approaching the Earth to wipe us out, um, and he just so happened to get some little fragments of that, we're, mm. we're all in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. That's my two cents. Good. Now, I want to know what that cir little circle is that's orbiting the Earth all the time in your picture. Yeah, that's... That little does. blue circle. Yeah, that, that's what the, you know, yeah, that way professionals, you know, have something strange come, you debunk, explain, you know, no mystery, that's the best. Yeah. Right, we're professionals. Yes. Hey, yes. Well, um, you know, I thought of something else, uh -huh. is that um, there's a company out there, it's a startup, and mm -hmm. it's called Freefall Aerospace. Huh. You can look at them, look them up uh, on the web. Well, anyway, they have a design where they want to put a CubeSat up in orbit and then be able to inflate an antenna, um, you know, at once it's in orbit. And so this, the antenna, again, it, it's inflatable. So, you know, with a very, very small percentage of gas. And so one of their concerns is that they would have some debris up in orbit or just, um, to pre like, I don't know, asteroids, but you know, very, very small particles um, puncturing their, you know, their, uh, their satellite. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to locate one or one of the people at the company. And again, it's called Freefall Aerospace. Mm -hmm. You can look them up on the web about this inflatable antenna idea. Mm -hmm. um, but one of their employees looked up on a NASA website someplace and they found out the, the, the probability distribution 
for um, small particles coming in, you know, from from outside uh, outside Earth's orbit, you know, just interplanetary type of debris that could puncture their satellites. So just a thought here is that if you wanted to, to do a science experiment, if you will, then you could find data like that and find out what's the likelihood um, of some sort of, of those particles that you're seeing on there. What's the likelihood that those could be, you know, just reflections of small rocks, um, you know, uh, coming in from, you know, other parts of space or whatever, or just debris that's uh, normally there. Because I know that here on the Earth, we have the atmosphere that protects us, but we know that there's a lot more rocks that, um, uh, a lot more debris that would impact the Earth if it weren't for our atmosphere. Well, the moon doesn't have that sort of, a, doesn't have an atmosphere like that that protects it. So, so the moon, just when you look at the craters anyway, you know, it just seems that there's a lot more debris that the, that um, intersects with the moon. So it just seems likely that those particles are, or could potentially be something like that. Um, and or just like Marty said, some, some things, some sort of um, optics can play a role in there and uh, distort things. So it just seems to me that there's a lot of different explanations of what that stuff could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. But you know, I don't think it's again if it if it is something that big that can be picked up by an amateur, we're all in trouble because yeah. there's a lot more of it out there getting pretty close to the earth. Mm, exactly. For him to find that probably two or three hundred mile piece of something that's casting a shadow on the moon. And just so happen if you, if that person did that, we are all in trouble because lots there where there's one there's more, and that was the lucky one that got pulled into the moon's orbit. So anyway, that was a great discussion. Appreciate you showing that. Well, you is nice, even though you is nice for low orbit, you know, but still, you know, something uh, to, to think about. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Because it's Yuri's night. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I think that puts an onus on you or an obligation to come up with a credible explanation just because it's Yuri's night. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. we did. There's two scenarios. It's Earth-based interference or it's a large piece from some comet and where there's one there's more we better look out yeah it's an alien it's from mars it could have been <laughs> the people uh you know the klingons we had earlier too so. those are some tough klingons but ken tor uh, photon tor photon torpedo uh, yeah <laughs> we need to get a, a better equipped you know right. weaponized that's what happened when I advertised in Las Vegas for this thing. The, the, the aliens come out in Las Vegas. That never would have happened if I didn't advertise it here. So, so we need to put up the shield. That's know. right. Yeah. Get a face, uh, for them to be the everything ready. Yeah. But this begs the bigger question, Ken. Like, you know, we're just lucky the, the things that you've done, you haven't had that interference. But how, is there a system to eliminate that kind of situation? Yeah, actually, uh, Zoom has uh, uh, made some security updates. So actually, it, here they can actually lock the meeting. If you feel these people are, are kind of uh, all safe, you know, all joined, you can. They, this is the new feature. They just updated two days ago. You can lock the meeting so nobody else can uh, penetrate. But the thing is, if it's all, if it's for private private meeting, you know, all the people you, you want to be in the meeting. Right. Uh, you know that's fine, but if it's you know in Shaker's point, she she wants as many people to attend as possible. Right. So that could be a problem because you don't know who who is who and who is, maybe he didn't register and but because Shaker post post the uh, right yeah that's why I didn't want to. Uh, you know, well, I, I have discussion with him, but he insisted. 
because he uh, won everything public, no trouble, you know. So it's hard to argue. So, you know, it's public, so thousands of people see it. So there was no way, you know. Right. And the, if they, you know, some people, they, you know, they would, you know, write their, their, their name, but some people put some strange name, you would never catch up, ca you never catch it, you know. Right. And um, you want to increase their attendance, but at the same time, people playing pranks, you know, it's, yeah. it's very tough, you know. But I, I don't think this is, uh, uh, yeah, the Zoom actually also removed, I don't know if you noticed, they removed the chat room. Remember two weeks ago, there's a chat room, right. you can chat, now they remove it. And uh, I, I think because, you know, if you allow the chat room and uh, some hacker, they can put the script. They can, you know, hack you with the script, uh, okay. some, insert some code, backdoor malware. So they actually improve it by removing that feature. Although some people feel it's, it's not convenient, but I think they try to, you know, uh, prevent any possible hackers. Uh, initially, the, the situation is, is that, uh, you know, some people report uh, some people hack in Zoom and put the pranks, you know. Um, uh, so that's their concern. But they, they, they improve it. I, I noticed they remove the chat room and also put this uh, lock, lock meeting uh, feature over there. But if for private meeting, that's probably good. But, you know, for our purpose, especially what Shaker wanted, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of weird. it's a dilemma. You know, yeah. and that's in what you, you have to send out so many people, there's no way you can live in that, limit, limit it. Yeah, if there's just a way to quickly identify who those people are, like when they're doing something. Yeah, but it's on the system, it doesn't show uh, either the IP address or that we probably have to go check with the Zoom, they probably have the record. But yeah. just from the system, and it doesn't show the IP address or, uh, you know, what kind of system they're using? That does show this kind of information should be there, but it's only in the Zoom system, uh, their own system, not the, not the, on our system. Right. But they did make some, you know, improvement. So, so I think it's. Uh, uh, but I, I think for tonight, I think it's just some people uh, making making the pranks and uh, they use fake names. And right. Hard, but when you know, I sent out to like a thousand people. You sent out like. Yeah. 10,000, it's like out of those numbers, you're gonna get yeah. like aliens. Yeah, initially I discussed with Sheikha like three times. I said, are you, are you sure? You know, which typically people register in the confirmation uh, email, they provide the, you know, those login, you know, those right. kind of, but Sheikha didn't like that. He feels this is perfect, as many people as possible, you know, so in this case, uh, it's a dilemma. Yeah, it's a dilemma. But even if they had sent an email, it could have been from a, you know, just a burner email, and yeah. then you send them the, the numbers, and they would have done it anyway. Yeah. You know, yeah. We made it as easy as possible for them, but if they want to do it, they certainly can come in from another email and come in. So. Yeah. Yeah, actually, because Shika asked me to post all the, you know, the one link, and that means you don't have to input a uh, password or something, and, uh, the, the, you know, uh, it's convenient that way, but at the same time, if only people register for it has a password, then that, that might make it a bit easier, but then the attendance might drop a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. If, if people are interested enough to come on, they can certainly copy paste the yeah. password. In, in, in the beginning, do you, do you remember they were trying to do the graffiti, you know, the painting on the, on the screen? Right. That, yeah. we had, that the system has a feature to block them. That it can, we can do. Uh, oh. But for the voice, you know, that that's unless you identify who, who, who he was, so it's very going to be difficult. Right. Uh, so that's why I ask people to, you know, log off and log back in so right. we can check out one by one who is the problem, uh, who was yeah. the, the problem. Yeah. Actually, right now there is somebody actually also trying to log in. I just block it out because the name is very strange. Yeah, oh. So I have to apologize to Barry because initially, you know, we asked people to log off, so he, he was, uh, he could not join in, in initially. It's not we are trying to block people out, it's because of uh, people making pranks. We have to, uh, you know, screen uh, the second time. Yeah. Yeah. So they were, they were hooligans. Hooligan Klingons. That's right. Hooligan Klingon. Yeah, yeah. We need to... Uh, yeah. It, it's good they tightened it up some. I, we usually use GoTo, but... But it's Zoom is a lot less expensive for. Um, yeah, yeah. What we're thinking maybe WebEx, you know, is, is a good a good idea. You know? 
Yeah, WebEx too is another one. But yeah. But still, you can get you know if you publicly put your credentials out there and they can get into the meeting, they can still do. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Yeah. Here. yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I I I I didn't want to argue with Sheka. We, we talked three times. You just feel it should be public. There's no reason. You know. Well, now we we have some documented proof. <laughs> I, I got some video of their uh, Klingon okay. language, so I, we can play it for Shekar if he wants to hear it. That's right. Yeah, let him to defeat those uh, Klingons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we were attacked by Klingons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yuri's night. Yeah, it's kind of fun, but. You know. Yeah, it is. Alien, you know. Come That's right. You, you, you defended us. You got shut him down. Yeah, got sorry for that. Him. Yeah, yeah. I did my best. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the beginning of there. What the heck is Yeah, that? what the heck? It's very strange. Yeah. But yeah, I figure, you know, people are doing that. They're only doing it for one reason, and that's to get a reaction out of you. That's right. Yeah. So they, they got zero reaction at all. Yeah, yeah. That's true. And they want to disrupt the meeting for whatever reason, because that's what they do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They, want, they wouldn't be good Klingons if they didn't try to do Klingon stuff. Yeah, yeah. What was the other race? I think there's another race, right? Several other race. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure, but Star Trek. Yeah. But they were, they they were full on Klingons there. I tell that's you, right. there was no negotiation with them. That's right. So, Re uh, resist, yeah. I go ahead. No, I think that's uh, like the resistant is futile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was your great work. Appreciate you pulling this all together. And yeah, we had like about 16 people at the peak. So that, that was terrific. You know, I think it went terrific, especially with the late start. And probably some people got frustrated and didn't come back on after that, too. Or yeah, maybe not. Maybe. There were five, and that was like, <laughs> they just didn't get back in. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, Marty, what I noticed is they seem to be attacking you in person. Yeah. It's, it's, was your yeah. email request sent out in your name? Is that, is that how they, uh, how come they were, they were picking on you and the, leaving the rest of us alone? So I didn't. Uh... Well, because they, uh, I had, I don't know if you'd seen it. If you're on my list, or probably not. If you're, no, you're not on your list. No. Yeah. So. Well, from Las Vegas, from my list of a thousand, you know, which I got like 23 signups, I think. I sent out a nice little guide email and put my name on it. And I used the, my AAA email address. I didn't use my personal one. So they knew, you know, I was coordinating. The, yeah, yeah. So we'll see if I get more um, from them. <laughs> and then they emailed in. I sent it to Ken. Um, I could read what they said, part of our wrap-up entertainment here. Um, so this this person, what a name. Uh, Dur something, the last name or whatever. It was S-I-F-U-Z-Z-A-M-A-N. Oh, that's him. He's one of them. Right. So he goes, what is this? I joined the meeting and later it says, please wait. If joining the meeting is the subjective satisfaction of the host, then why selling tickets? Why do we need schedules? Well, we didn't sell any tickets. Okay. Yeah, please, please apologize to him because his, his uh, name looks very, you know, uh, similar to those uh, uh, prankers, you know, those people who, the fake names. Well, I'm sure this is the ba a bad person. So, anyway, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't even look like a real name. Yeah, you see, that, that's, that's, uh, and uh, you see what, what I did, well, I actually checked uh, the names on my end, the RSVP people on my name, on my end. And I don't, I don't have the name on your end, but I, I kind of compare if the uh, people, the name looks like, uh, or the phone number looks like uh, on the system. I think that's pretty much okay. But if the name is, doesn't match very well, and uh, you know, uh, they probably saw it in public and they just, you know, jump in, and then it, it looks very confused. So I didn't see that name. You know, yeah. the name you mentioned, I didn't see it, and uh, it, it, the name looks like the, the other name who uh, those aliens name. So there, I cannot run the risk. 
Yeah, the first name is D-H-R-U-B-O. Last name is S-I-F-U-Z-Z-A-M-A-N. Right. Yeah, that's, that's one of the names I saw, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, if, if it's the real person, we have to, I just uh, need to apologize to him. It's just a very bizarre situation tonight. We have no choice. Yeah, I'll just tell him to change your name to, you know, when we can understand. Yeah, yeah, that's when the joint type is more, um, you know, not put all the name in, into a long one. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's, you know, uh, that make people confused. Yeah. So, anyway, well, no, this was great. I'm just real happy with how this turned out. We're even able to help some folks and learned a bunch of new stuff. I got two websites to go check out and uh, yeah, I learned a lot and appreciate you getting all the internet stuff there, Ken, and the space station view, and it looks like it's just coming into the darkness now. So yeah, it is. looks like um, a big picture there. Bright future for us. That's right, a bright future. Unless that was uh, some real comet pieces going around the moon, in which case this was our last uh, yeah, double A event. <laughs> or close to it. Because <laughs> those pieces were pretty darn big. So anyway, so I just gotta figure out how to get back to my other screen here. Whoops. What's it? Full screen. Well, uh, thank you all for coordinating that. Yeah. And, um, it was an interesting discussion and I just seeing how or what can happen on Zoom meetings was very educational. We have to be, make sure we plan for this in the future because we don't want all these people yelling and screaming and they were writing all sorts of stuff on your screen and everything else, so. Yeah, the thing on the screen we can block, that's, that's easy. Yeah. 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 For the voice. But you, yeah. have to know, you didn't have to know who it was. Yeah, block. because there's a feature we can just clear all and block no, no, block all from, from uh, painting on, on, the, on the screen. So yeah. we don't have to know who this person was, you know, so that's easy. But for the voice, you know, we can mute everyone, but, you know, people need to talk. You know? right. it, it, so initially I try to mute everyone and pull back, but, you know, the, the, you know it's, that's why I feel the, the strange name you mentioned. I noticed when I unmute un him, this, those aliens showed up, so I thought it was, it was probably one of them. You know, I could be wrong, you know, but there are a couple of them, so I unmuted, and then that's why I figure it's better everybody lock off, you know, then join. Then uh, this way we can, you know, filter one by one. <clears throat> yeah, but well, what if you had like 100 people on there, then that just wouldn't have been possible. Yeah, what we'll do, you know, is it, probably, uh, uh, you know, we didn't expect it, so everybody can directly join. But what we can do is we, we can put them, uh, you know, like in a waiting room, you know, and uh, so only we feel this uh, comfortable, you know, this everything looks fine. And, uh, you can admit one by one, each of them. You yeah. know, that's what we can do in the future. I mean, you know, basically we didn't expect this would happen because the previous time everything was fine. So we try to make it easy for the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, you know. yeah. Oh, George, George, I think you mentioned the space debris. Actually next week, next Saturday, uh, we have this uh, new space mini conference also on Zoom, and Marty is going to present too. And then we have uh, a speaker is going to talk about the space debris liability. Two mm -hmm. speakers. So the, the space debris has been always an uh, important topic, you know, for us. Last year we have four four experts. You now they were talking about the uh, space debris mitigations. Uh, so this uh, so next Saturday we have the uh, you know uh, for, you know the uh, more more presentation. All right, very good, gentlemen. Good to see you. Thank you all. I'll good see you night now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Doug. Mm -hmm. yeah, bye -bye. Good job, Marty and Ken. Yeah, good. Marty, Ken. good job. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. Good night. Good night, all. Yeah. Thank you. See y'all. Night. Happy Bye. Uri's night. Happy Uri's night. Yep. Yeah. Klingons be gone. Klingon. 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 All right.